Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Mary Tipton. She is an internal medicine pediatrics physician, and she wrote the Kevin MD article, Why Socialized Healthcare is Not Right for America. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's great to be here. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? I would be happy to. So I'm a med peds physician in uh, Salt Lake City area. It's a Southern suburb. Um, I own a medium sized private practice. I have been for the last 15 years. I also have four children and uh, an amazing husband who helps me manage all that. He's a full-time dad and a part-time Air Force reservist. Let's see, I also do primary investigative research mostly for vaccines and a few years ago, I became more involved uh, like local and national politics, specifically about healthcare reform, just increasingly interested in trying to make healthcare more accessible and affordable for my patients. So I was lucky enough to connect with some like-minded physicians, started in a Facebook group, but I do work with several national groups of physicians and um, we believe that healthcare should be personalized and not partisan. So uh, healthcare reform should be led by physicians and that's what I'm trying to do. The numbers of physicians who have private practices is slowly declining over the years. Now, tell me what you think are some of the biggest challenges to continue staying employed in a private practice. Uh, there's lots. Uh, although this year I've seen a lot of the benefits as well, mm -hmm. um, because we're able to be a lot more nimble and responsive during a pandemic and less constrained by bureaucracy. But the challenges are, are the bureaucracy, essentially. There's just so many regulations that you have to keep up with. It's hard to compete sometimes for good staff and uh, physicians because maybe like a big corporation in, like the University of Utah here can say, oh, we can provide... Um, uh, tuition, you know, for mm -hmm. your medical assistance, and like we can't provide tuition for private practice, uh, so we have to provide other benefits to make them come to us. Um, but there is there is just a lot. There's a lot of pressure, uh, and and physicians are tired. You know, it's busy just to be a physician. So a lot of physicians don't want to be business people. They don't mm -hmm. want to run a practice, understandably. So just a lot of people have kind of given up. I think they think it's impossible to do private practice, so they become employed. So talk about the flip side. What are some of the benefits of staying in private practice today? Oh, the benefits have been many, especially during the pandemic. So we were able to switch to telemedicine within a week. We've been able to just pivot very quickly to provide testing for our patients to way before other large corporations in our area were able to manage that. Um, we set policies that match with our patient population, our current uh, levels of COVID and, and that sort of thing. And we can change them when we need to. Um, so the benefits really are just that added ability to adjust to the market and to serve your patients and to not have to go through, you know, five meetings and, and, and someone worrying about what other people are going to think to make a change. And if you were to do it all over again, would it be private practice or an employed model? Definitely private practice. All right. So let's transition now into your Kevin MD article. It's titled, Why Socialized Healthcare is Not Right for America. And this is a question that we've been debating in healthcare policy for, for decades now as we try to fix our American healthcare system. Now, for those who didn't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Yes. So last year, mid-pandemic, like always happens, we have healthcare needs. I had a need to get a SVT ablation. I was having episodes of heart rate over 200 and passing out of, in dangerous places, and I needed that. My son needed reconstruction of his eardrum, and that was um, something that was going to be necessary to be done by a highly specialized physician. So we wanted to get these things done and it happened to be during a pandemic, but we were able to. We got them done close to home. We had a highly trained physician help us and we got excellent results. And at that same time, my sister, who currently lives in England with her uh, five children, had to fly here just to get her son a tooth pulled. Mm -hmm. A six-year-old could not get into the dentist to get a tooth pulled for a repeated abscess for which she'd had repeated courses of antibiotics and no success. So she had to fly all the way to Utah to get a tooth pulled. And just the dichotomy of difference, you know, between that socialized healthcare system and our privatized healthcare system being able to respond to a pandemic was the basis of what I started to say why one of the, one of the main problems in socialized healthcare is, is uh, the inability to accommodate, you know, to problems like a pandemic. So that became just kind of obvious personally. And I decided to write an article about why 
socialized healthcare is not the answer for our healthcare system problems. Of course, the United States, we're not without our many, many problems in our healthcare system. Specifically, we don't have universal health care. Not everyone is covered by some type of health insurance. And that right. is uh, an advantage that socialized health systems have. So uh, what do you say to that? Uh, main thing being coverage is not care. Mm -hmm. And um, providing coverage, you know, everyone in England right now still has coverage, but very few have care. Um, there have been staggering delays of people trying to get care. I just was reading about an article that the uh, routine hospital care, you know, surgeries like a gallbladder, the waits are a hundred times longer now in England than they were before a pandemic. I mean, it, it's t over 12 months is, or about uh, 12 months is what it used to be for gallbladder surgery. And now it's a hundred times that, I mean, it's essentially like not even mm -hmm. possible to get care there. So, so coverage does not equal care and we're increasingly realizing that. And yet um, been not very good. I think about coming up with solutions for that. So I feel like the main uh, things that we need to have in whatever system we go forward with, I'm not specifically, uh, you know, advocating one, that one thing we do is wrong or right exactly at this problem, but we've got to look at three main issues. We have to figure out how we can provide quality, mm -hmm. still high quality, but have lower costs and, and maintain choices for our patients. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anyone traveling to a country with socialized medicine to mm -hmm. get hair, care. People come here. To, here is where we have the highest quality. So there are several charts that I've read that the United States also, you know, we have the highest cost in the world, like 20% yes. of our GDP is, is funneled to our healthcare system. And I'm sure that a lot of us have seen those charts comparing administrative costs in the United States compared to other, say, single payer healthcare systems, um, like in, in Canada, for instance. So what is your opinion in terms of how we could decrease costs in the United States? I agree. Cost is the crux of everything. So if we have already high quality and we want to maintain it, the main problem that is a, is a factor that's preventing us from being able to do that forever, I guess, is the spiraling costs. Mm -hmm. Because we can't continue to provide or to, to dedicate or utilize more and more and more of our resources to pay for really excessively priced healthcare um, beyond maybe what the value indicates. You know, like the charts you said, like, why do we spend so much and then maybe not get as much as we should for mm -hmm. that dollar? So what I found by looking into this and learning the things I have in the last few years is that we have uh, a big problem with middlemen in our, in our market. And a lot of the prices are just basically jacked up because we're having increasingly consolidated markets, no, pass, no uh, transparency of these prices. Patients don't have the ability to choose and maybe make choices that would create a balance between value and high cost. You know, so like if you were just given the choice to have a car and someone said, well, you can have a car, I mean, whichever one you want. Like if you didn't have to pay the cost, I mean, you'd probably buy the highest price. You'd probably just grab the Ferrari and say, well, why not? But, you know, ev in every other market in our country, we have a balance between where we can choose cost versus value. And, and we don't have that in healthcare. So I think price transparency is the key to lowering costs. Unless there's a connection between the consumer and the provider of services, there's just not gonna be a market-based adjustment. And so price transparency is one of my main focuses because I believe that will lead to some of the other um, improvements where patients could say, oh yeah, I don't need that. I, I'm not gonna pay that highest price thing because it's not gonna provide me that much added benefit. And, um, but the problem right now being that we don't have price transparency. We also have a broken supply chain and just high drug prices, and then those just add to the high insurance prices. Some patients, when they go to the hospital, if they go to the emergency room, they're just not in a position to, to choose based on price. So how can we help those patients who have high health care costs, but if they go to the hospital for an emergent reason and they can't choose based on price, like how can we help these type of patients? Yeah, that's a good question. There has to be some crisis care, you know, just like with your car or whatever, you, you may not choose bumper to bumper coverage for every little thing. You don't need it for the oil change. You don't need it to fill the gas tank, but you need it when you get in a crash and you didn't know that was going to happen and everything gets wrecked. So, I mean, high deductible Christ truly insurance is reasonable. So I feel like there has to be some way in our market that we do have coverage for those emergencies, but it's been found that 85% of healthcare expenses are are shoppable you know they are planned like my ablation like my son's surgery they are um, like most dental care like just 85 percent and but people can't even do that so if we could transform at least to have options in the market where people could shop for the things they can shop for and then they could get insured for crisis and emergency care at a much lower 
price point than we do have right now for these Cadillac plans, then we could have some sort of balance and decrease overall cost and lower waste. So you mentioned price transparency and having catastrophic care as two of the pillars that we need going forward. What mm -hmm. other changes would you recommend for our healthcare system if you were to design the ideal healthcare system? So we definitely need to have, like I said, the patient choice. I mean, currently the system, the Affordable Care Act is restricted patient choice because there's so many really high out-of-pocket costs for, for those who, who want good and affordable health care. They can't make the choices and, they, and it's through their employer. So they don't have choice of which plan they get or even, you know, how much it costs. And they're really not paying those costs. So patient choice is going to be essential. In that case, we really need to get insurance companies out of the of the focus of, of the whole thing. I mean, everything is focused, like you said, on coverage and on insurance. And yet insurance does not equal healthcare. If we could somehow remove, like I said, the, uh, the sanctity of the whole process, I think is that physician patient relationship. And so I'm always at odds in my exam room, sadly with my patients discussing like what I can and can't do for them and what, what the barriers are for care because they're not paying me and I'm not able to provide them you know, directly something that, that they want the value that they want because of this third party payer. So the insurance I believe is, is like sort of the, has been the solution, but now it's part of the big problem because we need to be able to allow options. I mean, if there's a public option that we have at some point and that could be good, we need something, you know, like you said, to cover the urgency. But if we choose things like the Medicare for all policy that has, that was uh, proposed, it outlaws privatized health insurance. I mean, that would be, devastating and change our complete landscape of what we have. So if we do have uh, some, you know, network, which we need um, to capture indigent care and some sort of basic health care, then that can't exclude private health care um, and private practice, I guess, or direct primary care, which is also a very good example. You may have talked to some of your early practice members uh, about things that can so solve. So, so direct, a direct relationship between the providers and consumers. And so then uh, that's key. In your ideal healthcare system, what do you envision the role of government to be? I guess minimized. Mm -hmm. um, I, one thing I wanted to point out, I really believe that people think that by a government run system that it would solve some of these uh, perverse incentives and, and things that exist. But I have found with my experience that that's not the case. Government is Government healthcare now is basically privatized. Medicare Part D was ushered in under the uh, Bush administrations and they're making millions. Affordable Care Act is just a, a pipeline of money um, from Medicare, Medicaid programs that are all privatized and managed by private practice, private businesses basically. Um, if, and they just funnel money to those businesses and those cronies and at the dime of, of all of us on healthcare, you know, taxpayers, I mean. So government should be, less involved, I, I guess, or maybe it's hard to say, but the problem is that our current government is a crony system. Mm -hmm. I mean, our current government, how, how do you, how do you in, encourage these government officials to not uh, continue down the same road when they're basically bought and sold and paid for by big business? You know, they had, they, they lobbying, almost all HHS secretaries have, have transitioned to be lobbyists after it, that tells you something. So they're, the current Congress and, and politicians or something are getting a lot of money for maintaining the status quo and doubling down on a health insurance heavy and, and care for all policies, you know, because that funnels the money to the same people, not to the government exactly, but mm -hmm. to the government who, who gets money from private companies at that kind of makes sense. So I, I think people think that, oh, by choosing the government or the socialized healthcare system, then we'll get away from this, you know, crony capitalism. But our current system is crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I have no reason to believe it would be different. So I'm just afraid that if people are not going to get what they think they're going to get, like they're going to choose this and say, oh, yeah, this is going to be government. It's going to be free from influence of these perverse incentives. And yet, it, why, why, why would it be? It's been the same for 20, 30 years, and it'll probably just be more of the same. Oh, does government have a role in terms of negotiating drug prices? And I think that's one of the things that was previously restricted in Medicare, that uh, Medicare wasn't able to negotiate its own drug prices. And I think sometimes that's a big mistake. I think I, I agree. That's It's asinine. It's like, wait, they're a huge consumer. They, we pay the bills because we are the taxpayers and they can't negotiate drug prices. I mean, but that was a backroom deal made by Bush and Part D Medicare that he agreed to because why? Because they're bought off by the people who are going to benefit from that to keep drug prices high. 
So a lot is broken in our system and, and, and it's been manifested on both sides of the aisle for a long time. And unless I think physicians who are like me, I have no conflicts of interest. Like I go to DC and talk to lawmakers and I don't get a penny. It is all funded by me. I'm a private practice mom of four in South Jordan who just wants to help my patients and get government out of the exam room. So, I mean, I should be a more valid or unbiased um, type of opinion. I, I believe, and I'm trying to make my voice a little bit more heard because certainly the other voices and politicians that have so far shaped our system are heavily conflicted. Now, what's your opinion of the Affordable Care Act? Um, if you had a choice, would you feel like that's something that needs to be repealed or is this something that could be built upon? I don't think repeal is a good mantra or, or really going to be popular. A lot of people really like a lot of the fundamental parts of the Affordable Care Act that helped them. You know, like we definitely need to have um, pre-existing conditions protected. We, people like to have their children covered up to age 26. So repeal is not something that I think I have pushed or, 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 or opted for. I just, I don't think we should expand upon it. And I think we need to emphasize that these disruptors in the system be allowed to continue, whether that's direct primary care, whether that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, independent physicians being more than employed physicians so that people can speak out. I, I just want, you know, a robust system where all can, where the patients can choose and the market can kind of self-select to maintain quality, keep costs lower and provide good health care. So I, I wouldn't say repeal or necessarily replace, maybe just modify and have other systems alongside that compete with it. One of President Biden's promises is to introduce some type of public option eventually into the Affordable Care Act. Do you think that's a step in the right direction? I do not. I think it's what I said. I think it's a double down on policies that have just made the rich people in healthcare and the broken supply chains more powerful and richer, and it would be really the same. And, and a public care option would definitely uh, or, or could really reduce like as an employer myself, I, I have 50, 60 people. Like if I, I pay a lot of money to provide healthcare to my, to my employees. Why, why would any business then continue to provide private healthcare if there was a cheap public option? And, and they would say, well, I'm pushing everyone to this public option. And then why would physicians continue to provide care if they get paid less and less? So we're going to have a problem where there's a public option, but it's not quality or it's not uh, at, and we'll have a two-tier system. And that's what's happened in many or the other socialized countries. I mean, as you know, people in England, people in other countries, they pay for the doctors and everyone else gets everything else, which is not fast or, or good. We're talking to Mary Tipton. She is an internal medicine pediatrics physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, why socialized healthcare is not right for America. Mary, I want to pivot now into physician advocacy. And that's something that I've been talking about on my blog for years now, that physicians need to be involved more in healthcare yeah. policy because any healthcare decision that's made on a political level, it's going to affect our lives as physicians and of course the lives of our patients as well. What are some ways that you could recommend that physicians can become more active in the policy arena? Thank you for asking this question. I think it's very important. So I have just, because I'm in private practice, been able to speak up a little bit more. Um, I've learned that I can just write something and maybe people will read it. I share information with my local and um, even national politicians. And, and, and these politicians, they don't know anything about healthcare. They really don't. They want to hear from physicians. And so do patients because they trust physicians, you know, trust in the Congress, for example, is at an all-time low, but trust in physicians is at an all-time high, probably, in most cases. So your opinion and your information is valued. You know, my patients look to me to know what to do about this COVID vaccine. They look to me to know a lot of different things. And so that power is uh, a great responsibility, um, and, but, but should be utilized, I think, because then you can share with patients. So I've been involved, um, like I said, in local and national things, and it's just kind of speaking out is one way to let people know that you, what you think. But um, it is hard when you're not in private practice. I'll tell you that a lot of uh, physicians are muzzled basically these days by their corporations that, and they're afraid for their jobs. So I, I think that's a drawback to, to emphasizing the physician voice is the increasing employed physician status. And when you talk to your physician colleagues about becoming more involved politically or advocating on behalf of physicians, What's their interest level generally in doing that? Fairly low, <laughs> to be honest. People are afraid. 
and physicians especially, we have had a rough year, right? Like one, what is one last thing? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just like everyone else, super busy. And um, I think they're afraid to get involved. They're afraid of what people would think and they're afraid of the time commitment. So there's uh, definitely a lot of barriers there, but maybe people like uh, who were brave to help me, to show me how I could use my voice. Maybe I can be like them and, and show other people the same thing. And my final question, what's your take old message you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? So I believe we've got to keep the incentives aligned. We need more models where Americans and not insurance companies and, and certainly not government um, can make the rules. We need a healthcare system where people are free to choose their physician and where physicians are free to practice medicine based on their experience and their training and, and not the dictates of bureaucrats and, and public or private. So um, it's gonna work best when we've got patients that are fully informed. If they know about prices, if they can make choices based on price and quality, they can make their own healthcare decisions and it will be better for everyone and cheaper for everyone. So I do believe we can fix this, but I really, really believe that we should be extraordinarily cautious about the basically socialized direction that some, our current administration wants to take things. And how can people reach you? So I am available on Twitter at MDTiptonMD. Um, I'm also involved, like I said, nationally in a group called Free to Care. That's free and then the number two, care.org. So it's a coalition of private and citizens and also physicians that want to uh, push some of these principles and really fight for our patients. So I encourage you to look at both of those options. Mary, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much.